This video exists to help you get it right on the first try. And we're gonna do that by going over important key features to look for in a holster, as well as go over really helpful tips that can help you avoid the box of shame altogether. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In this week's video, we're talking about how to stop buying holsters that won't work. Believe it or not, there is a bit of a science behind this. I know previously there's just been this idea that you have to try all of these many things in order to find the thing that is going to fit you like a Cinderella shoe. And honestly, it's just not true. There's more to it than that. And you don't have to waste your money and go through the incredibly frustrating process of building up your box of misfit holsters. So how do we do this? I'm only gonna say this once, which is not true at all. I'm probably gonna say it a couple of times. Do your research up front. Save yourself so much frustration and just do the research up front. There's so much information out there about quality holsters, the things that we need to look for in a holster, and there's so much information that exists now on concealment features, concealment mechanics, and all of those things are gonna play into your success with your holster and play into the purchasing process. But if you don't take the time to do the research on the front end, you're going to continue down on your box of misfit holsters. Fortunately, if you're watching this video, then you are starting down on that process. Whether you already have a box of misfit holsters or you're just getting into this process and you're really hoping to avoid it, this video is going to kind of help guide you through that process and point you towards more resources. I will say that throughout all of this process, I'm mainly talking about appendix carry. There are things about carrying behind the hip that are just really not conducive to concealment mainly that when your body moves or bends, the gun does not really go with you the same way that it can when you're carrying appendix. So when I'm talking about these concealment features and these keys to customization and concealment, I'm primarily talking about carrying between the 10 and two o'clock position. So what do you need in a holster? First, most importantly, we need safety, we need concealment features, we need efficient design, and we need a budget. That does not mean that you should be prepared to spend an absolute fortune on your first holster, although it does mean that you're going to have to put some time and invest some time into this process, again, doing the research on the front end, and also just putting time into the customization process, making sure that you're really dialing this in for yourself. Like John Hellman says, it's a lot like fitting a prosthetic. There's a lot more to concealment success than just buying the perfect holster. So the first thing that we want to establish is what makes a holster safe. Because if we're using a holster that's not safe, we're more or less defeating the entire purpose of carrying a gun in the first place. So there's four things that you want to make sure that your holster has in order to know that it's a safe holster. It needs to have hard trigger protection on both sides of the trigger guard. It needs to have appropriate retention, which we'll go into in a minute here. It also needs to allow you reliable access to your firearm and it needs to have an open mouth. I think hard trigger protection on both sides of the holster is pretty self-explanatory. You don't really need to go more in depth on that. We know that we want the trigger protected appropriately, but we do need to talk a little bit about what holster retention means because there's all different kinds of retention. And when we're talking about a concealment holster and inside the waistband holster, we're not talking about an active retention holster where you actually need to like press a button or do lift a hood or do something like that to release the gun it is a pressure kind of retention. So some holsters are going to have fixed retention where you can't actually change the retention. The holster is gonna come in a fixed retention. There's also holsters that you can change the retention and those are gonna have kind of soft gummy like um, spacers between the two pieces of kydex and that's going to allow you to kind of tighten it down or loosen it at whatever you'd like but there's ways to test for appropriate retention. I've talked about this on my channel before where I've discussed the shake test. Um, generally, that's not going to work reliably or consistently for you and it's, it's difficult to repeat well. I think one of the best ways to actually test for appropriate retention is to of course make sure that your firearm is clear, place it in your holster, inside the waistband, how you're going to actually be wearing it, and then just kind of perform various tasks. Cause you can even try doing some exercises, do some squats, some push-ups, jumping jacks is a really great way to do it. So do some high knees, just try some different ways that are going to induce movement 
and shake within the holster and to the gun so that you can test whether or not the gun is actually retained appropriately inside your waistband. There's actually a lot of resources on testing retention. Um, Filster actually put out a blog post a couple weeks ago that really, really deeply outlines holster retention, how to test for it appropriately, and the different kinds of retention that exist. So if you wanna do a full on deep dive on this specific topic, I would highly encourage you to do that and check out the links below. Mind you, these are just links for helpful information. If there's anything that's an affiliate link down below, it will be clearly shown and you will know that before clicking on the link. The next one is that you need to have an open mouth on your holster. This means that you don't want a holster that actually collapses in on itself when the gun is no longer in the holster. And the reason for this is because it's almost impossible not to flag yourself, point the gun at yourself on the way into the holster if your holster is collapsing in on yourself. And finally, we want the holster to be able to provide us with consistent access to our firearm and that there's nothing about the holster itself that prevents us from getting reliable, consistent access to our firearm. So for example, some holsters will put a wing on the holster, but they'll build the wing way too close to the grip of the gun and you actually won't be able to get a consistent grip on the gun because the wing wing is interacting with your fingers and preventing you from getting consistent access. You might be able to gain access to your firearm, but it's pretty hard for you to get consistent access. So that's just something to pay attention to when you're looking into holsters and carry systems. Okay, so now that we've established what makes a safe holster, let's talk about what actually makes a good quality holster. First, a good quality holster is going to have concealment features of some kind. There's three main concealment features to look for in a holster, and that is a wing, built-in holster wedges, and additional holster length. All of these concealment features are going to work in conjunction with pressure from something like a belt or an Enigma in order to function properly. If you're not putting any pressure on the holster, as in like you're clipping it to a pair of leggings or a pair of jeans, that's not providing adequate pressure to the gun in order to bring it in close to your body. And those concealment features will not be activated the way that they're supposed to, and you'll have less than desirable results. So first let's talk about wings. I actually have a two minute Tuesday, I'll link above and down below about this specific topic. But one thing I wanna mention in this video is that not all wings are created equal. The main wings on the market right now that you probably wanna be looking for in a holster is the mod wing, the dark wing, and the raven wing. And the thing that you'll notice about all of these is that they have two holes connecting them to the holster. There are some holster companies out there that only attach their wing with one hole. And the problem with that is that it's going to allow spinning. So you're going to wanna to make sure that you get a wing that has those two holes attaching it to the holster. The wing is going to work in conjunction with pressure and it's going to press up against a belt or an enigma and it's going to press the grip of your gun in closer to your body. So that's gonna help mitigate grip printing. There are also other ways to achieve similar grip tuck. The Filster Tuck Strat works with the pull the dot loop. Jam Custom Kydex uses a belt wedge to tuck the grip and Tenacore uses a belt cam system to tuck the grip. All of these systems can be good when you're carrying with a belt, but note that they're not going to work with the Enigma. Next, let's talk about additional holster length. A lot of holster companies actually build additional holster length into their holsters to prevent their users from experiencing their gun tipping away from their body, as well as to prevent painful hot spots. So what happens when your gun tips away from your body? There's two main things that happen when your gun tips away from you, and that is you get grip and rear sight printing. But one of the more obnoxious things in addition to printing that happens when your gun tips away from your body is the muzzle under the holster winds up poking you throughout the day, which can get really, really painful and uncomfortable. And these issues can be mitigated by just making the holster itself longer. So think about it like this. If something is pressing up against your body with a larger surface area, it feels more like a press, like it's just a soft press. Whereas imagine something poking you all the day long. There's a really big difference between a small surface area pressing into your body and a larger surface area pressing into your body. The idea of adding additional holster length relates to something called the keel principle, which I will link a video to above as well as down below. And finally, we're gonna talk about built-in holster wedges. There's a lot of different holster companies out there that use the built-in holster wedge to increase both comfort and concealment for their users. But the top ones that I can think of off the top of my head would be Filster, Henry Holsters, and Tenacore. You can also make 
or buy a holster wedge that you can just attach to your normal holster. Not everyone is going to want to use a holster wedge. So if you're kind of on the fence with this specific concealment feature, you might be better off just making or buying your own separate holster wedge and attaching it to your holster that doesn't have a built-in wedge. This is definitely a part of the customization portion of fitting a holster and such. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. The next thing we want is efficient design. What I mean by that is that we don't want the holster to counteract the concealment we're trying to achieve. If you're looking at a holster that is very wide or that has an attached magazine carrier, it will require more force to rotate the grip and the holster body will be more prone to breaking. Using holsters designed without excess width and with a separate mag carrier will let you conceal better with less effort and with less risk of holster failure. In order to get it right the first time, we need to make sure we're purchasing a quality setup. A good belt and holster combo will cost between $90 and $200, and an Enigma with a holster will usually cost about $150. The holsters on the table here are from Henry Holsters, JM Custom Kydex, Dark Star Gear, and Filster. I recommend starting your search looking at these brands. I wanna mention again that it's really important for us to do the research on the front end of this so that we avoid the box of shame because not everyone is going to need access to every single one of these concealment features, but they're not gonna know that unless they go through the process of dialing in their concealment using things like the poke and check method that I'll link down below. Have you noticed I've been keep saying I'm going to link things down below? The description box below is going to contain a ton of concealment mechanics and different things that you can reference to. So the point of this video is to share with you guys that you can't avoid the box of shame. You can avoid the box of misfit holsters. You have to do the research up front. And I'm going to provide you with as much resources as I possibly can below. And I intend to continue adding to it as more resources become available. Okay, so now that we've talked about holster safety and we've talked about quality features that we wanna look for in a holster, we need to talk about the most difficult part of this entire process and that is the customization period that you're going to have to subject yourself to in order to have concealment success. It is absolutely a minority of people who buy a holster and they put it on and it is perfect. It takes customizing. It's like fitting a prosthetic. You're probably not going to get it right on the very first try, but you've gotta put the time and effort it takes to really get there. In order to make that customization period a little bit easier on yourself, I wanna discuss a couple of things that can make a holster a little bit more easy to customize. So for a belt mounted holster, something that you might wanna look for to allow yourself a little bit more room for customization is something that allows you to adjust the ride height of your holster. And this can be achieved two different ways. It can be achieved through having a holster that has multiple clip attachment points or multiple holes in one spot to allow you to change where the clip itself rides, or you can get something like the Mod 4 1.5 Universal clips from Discrete Carry Concepts. Those have a little bit of wiggle room in the height. So even if your holster has just those two clips, the clip itself might actually allow you to kind of move things up and down just a touch, which can make all the difference. Beyond clip placement, holster customization can look like adding things to the holster, like a wedge or adding even like a little sticky pad or something to separate the kydex itself from your skin. It might even look like wearing a tank top or getting a bandeau bra and wearing that down on your hips. Yes, guys, you can do this too. It's all a part of the customization process and you gotta kind of lend yourself the opportunity to try things out and see what works for you. Honestly, you're choosing to carry a gun every single day of your life, and if it's not comfortable to some extent, you're probably going to have a hard time wanting to do that every single day, and eventually you'll grow weary of the discomfort that you're experiencing. The last thing I wanna know about the customization period that you're going to have to go through is that it's not all about gear selection. It can also be about clothing selection, and a big part of concealment and the comfort of carrying is going to have a lot to do with your body shape and where you're actually placing the gun. There are videos that already exist on how to find your concealment sweet spot, which I will have, again, linked down below so that you can view that and see what's gonna work best with your body type. If you want to continue your research on gear selection and concealment mechanics, check out the playlists here as well as all of the resources and links down in the description. This is what a box of Misfit holsters looks like. It's pretty bad. You don't want this. Well, since you're still here, I thought I would share 
that if you like watching these videos and you find them helpful, you might want to hit the subscribe button and note that if you have already hit the subscribe button and you're still not seeing my videos, it's because YouTube thinks that you need to also hit the notification bell. It's not really enough, I guess, for you to hit subscribe. YouTube is like, no, I need to know for certain. You need to tell me more than once. I need to know, do you really wanna see this person's videos? And if you want that, you have to also hit the notification bell. Thanks for coming to my TED talk.